All right, we should be live. Yes, you are. Excellent. Oh, dear. Hello, hey. everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Paradox Hour, where this time we will be discussing the Locked Tomb series, uh, specifically the first two books, Gideon of the Ninth and Hero of the Ninth. With me tonight are Genshuku. Hello. And Lord Lore. Hi there. I'm Captain Jack, and, uh, well, without further ado, let's get started then. So, yeah, I think I think the first person to say anything should be you, because of the three of us, you are the one who most recently finished the series, so yeah. uh, your impressions are probably the freshest. How do yeah. you, you even go about describing this series? <laughs> Lesbian space. In space. <laughs> yep. You're right. You're also right. trauma. So much trauma. I think, this... I think that's the beautiful thing about it. Like this, this lesbian necromancers in space tagline is, of course, a great joke. Also, absolutely describes the series. And if, like, you know, if you want to read the series when you hear it, but yeah. Also, does not at all describe the series because of the trauma. It simultaneously uh, tra- has so much irreverence to it and so much deep, dark angst to it. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, it's it's pretty... Yeah, I'm gonna say it's it's pretty unique in, in that respect. Like, I read a lot of fucked up shit, but... I will not say... A lot of it is, is this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, also, like, it's in... The other fun thing about The Locked Tomb is just, like, it feels like a modern story the way that, like, Dune and Lord of the Rings and even Brandon Sanderson's works feel old. And, like, they feel like yeah. they're, like, they feel older, but, like, older. Yeah. Whereas yeah. this one just feels modern. Yeah. yeah it, it feels modern feels despite taking place time. a thousand years in the future. Yeah. I'm I'm honestly going to be very interested if and how people will talk about this in like 20 years. If if someone were to read this for the first time in 20 years, I'm I'd be very curious to see how they feel about it. Especially with all because like it, the it, niche Tumblr yeah. memes and shit that uh, yeah, get slipped in. <laughs> that's the thing. Like there's so much in it that is so very today. Right. But, like that's the same way that like what well, like Asimov is writing his stories in such a way that yeah. like, like Asimov's works are timeless for sure, but also like you know like they have to be taken with the context of his time. Yeah, like the same way Lovecraft has to, the same way well, uh Tolkien has to, or do like Herbert's Dune has to yeah, in a real course, way. Absolutely. That's that's the thing. Like I and I'm very curious how where the lock tomb will land on that if it's if it's if it's just going to be, well, people today won't get the memes, but it's other than that, it basically stands on its own. Or if it's going to be like this, this book of an age, but I think that just doesn't really happen anymore. Yeah, no, that's fair. I like, like, like to compare it to another contemporary work, like, you know, oh God, um. The King Killer Chronicles is like another one of those books that just feels like it's old, but is written in the modern day. Yeah. To be and like fair, this... the King Killer Chronicles will be old by the time it finishes. Oh, if it God. Ever finishes. This is true. <laughs> but yeah, this one I think I'm just... I think part of the reason why this feels so fresh is the prose, definitely. Yeah, mm-hmm. her style is very, very, very modern of the of our time. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't but without like flowery language anything, too much. Just... Right. But but like... it's still it's still very <sighs> deliberate. It's not like she just basically wrote it down the way she would say it. It's still it's still very obviously very constructed Cracked. and deliberate language. The world it's building in this in this it's series is actually modern. really good. The I do appreciate is amazing. I do appreciate how it's like um unraveled bit by bit over the course of the narrative because yeah. like like 
the, the first book takes place entirely from Gideon's perspective, and she deliberately knows jack and shit about necromancy. Yeah. Like, I, I would mean, not also, be surprised if other she... things as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing is, like, these characters all have a history, right? Like, you know Harrow knows the inner workings of politics on the third, or <clears throat> yeah, how the sixth operates. But, like, we, the audience, doesn't, because yeah. Gideon gives zero shits. But, like, it's yeah. very clear that the other characters are living in a world. Yeah. And I think that's part of why Gideon is such a great viewpoint character to start with, because she's so deliberately aloof from a lot of the politics and magic of the world that makes it Gideon a lot easier for things. us to just learn about the world as yeah. she learns. Gideon knows two things, swords and what she likes, and she's wrong about the second one of those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, she's she knows possess- what she likes. She she knows what she likes. She's just wrong about the who. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Look, she's a disaster lesbian himbo, and we love her. Indeed, we Absolutely. do. We do. Oh, God. I mean, so Jack, like, what did you, like, think about going like about the story and like how it went like between the two books from like where it started and where it ended at the end of Harrow the Ninth. Like how did you feel about that? I feel like the progression is really, really well handled overall. Mm-hmm. Like the especially the progression of Gideon and Harrow's relationship, which is basically the core of the of the series, if we're being honest. Uh, oh, 100%. Most likely. Like, I have no idea how they're going to handle it in the, the third book, but for the first two books, what, uh, Harrow and Gideon's relationship is just the core foundation of the series, and it is just the most codependent, toxic, uh, just absolutely fucked up thing for a massive chunk of the series. And mm-hmm. it's going to be interesting to see how they move how they move or with that and past that because yeah. their their relationship has so much potential to be just like the most compelling thing. I mean, it already is right. a compelling thing, but it has so much potential to evolve into something really, really positive for them. If thing, if they figure out how to navigate it properly, the issue is that they are both clueless dumbasses when it comes to their relationship yeah. with each other. <laughs> Also, they're also just so intensely compromised in how they feel towards not only their, not only each other, but also other people. Oh yeah, everything. <laughs> like they're intense, immensely like, fucked up people. Like intensely yeah. just compromised, not because they're gay, but because they're just very broken people. Yeah, I mean, these are two people life hasn't given anything to, or. Uh, Except shit. <laughs> Look, there are only like, well-adjusted people in the first book, and they are the first to die. That's true. <laughs> um, bless the fifth, honestly. Yeah, bless the fifth. fifth the okay. I, I am. I was so glad when uh, Magnus and especially Abigail got more spotlight in Harrow. That was oh, really nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like their like their whole deal is arguably like they are the sweetest couple mm-hmm. I have ever yeah. seen. And it's just like they are very clearly a healthy relationship, which is yeah, I mean, that's, um, not something any of, of the other characters them. from the later went. Yeah, exactly, and that's kind of why you need them because if everyone was as fucked up as Harrow and Gideon are, like if no one had even a remotely healthy relationship, then then we wouldn't think anyone had a chance at one, right? We would just read it as well. Everyone in this universe is fucked. No, look, the relationships exist on a gradient scale uh, of fucked up. From Abigail and Magnus, who have a quite probably the single healthiest relationship in the entire series, let's be real. Uh, and the opposite end is Carol and Gideon. <laughs> well, the third is also intensely terrible. Oh, yeah, no, that's a whole other clusterfuck right there. No, but, should, but, but, let's, but I mean, let's if, talk if, about the characters real quick. Cause yeah, that's, that's there's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, there there's like what 19 18 characters in the uh first book of relevance. 
Yeah, but that's I mean, some count- of them are mostly just tragic. Uh, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> what was it? You have... Well, I mean, like, you have the second second to the ninth houses and, like, all the side characters they're in, right? And, like, the fourth and fifth are obviously, like, the most healthy, co- like, the most healthy pairings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you got the, uh... Six- Six is also kind of healthy. They have a healthy I mean, relationship. It's I just wouldn't like necessarily call it healthy, but it's at least not super fucked up. It's more it's wor- it's a working relationship. It's moderate yeah. codependence, but they still uh, have a good deal of functionality function. apart from yeah. each other. Yeah, they are not they are not intensely broken in the way others are. Well, I mean, the sixth is like I think like <clears throat> there's a clear reason why uh like spoilers, I guess. The sixth and the third are the two houses that make it to the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The two houses right? like, the ninth. Yeah. Right? Like the third is, you know, if Gideon and Harrow like if Harrow and Gideon went the um like decided to go even more fucked up, <laughs> that's the third. <laughs> that's that's yeah, kind of yeah. I mean and like if they went healthier and they went healthier, that's the sixth. Yeah, I think... that, that's kind of what I was going to say. I think the thing about the sixth is also of the of the functioning relationships, they are the one that is intensely not romantic. Like, right. I mean, it's hard to be romantic when uh, when uh, Palamides is just so head over heels for uh, Dulcie there. Yeah, of course, but but I mean, but that's that that shapes their relationship, right? The other functional relationship is an intensely romantic one because they are literally married and they are the functioning, mm-hmm. like, couple. well-adjusted couple. Uh, so, and and the teens are like, I'm not sure if it's necessarily Isaac and, romantic. I think they have a sibling relationship, Isaac and John Maria. Siblings, I, I think they're so family. They're more siblings. I think uh, I think of John Marie as like a baby lesbian just looking up to Gideon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's, there's something going on there. Um, yeah, I definitely got like more of a brother sister vibe from them or cousins. Yeah, yeah. but, but that's like, also that's, that's also a relationship that that Harrow and Gideon just can't have. Right, and then you have the coworkers in the form of the second and the eighth. Yeah, exactly. Oh god, the eighth house is so fucked up. <laughs> yeah. They're just idiots, honestly. Mm-hmm. They're just intensely stupid. Yeah. But... The second, but, too, but like, yeah, but different. <laughs> the second different and the levels. eighth make the most boneheaded decisions in the book. Yeah, in both books. Mm. Not so much in the second book. For the second, the second, the second makes some real shitty decisions. <laughs> mm. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll get to that when we get to that. We're focusing on the first book for now. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. <clears throat> yeah, I got right. a list of characters. Like, I feel like um, Judith and Marta don't really do much beyond um, be um, super persistent on getting um, yeah, pulling him back up after the body to the floor and um, fucking everything up by killing Teacher. Yeah, I think I think they are basically just there to be the status quo, like mm-hmm. right. But like, they're also the military. Like, right? they are yeah, they are the thing that Gideon aspired to to want. Exactly, exactly. They are what like, Gideon would have been. Like, I don't I think, think Gideon would ever have been able to uh, be remotely like no. either of them. No, no and I think I that's think, the point. I think, yeah, exactly. I think that speaks to to what we were saying that Gideon has essentially no concept of the outside world. Like, there's the second, which is, like, this very militaristic society. Like, her education literally comes from porn and comics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and while both of these things can be very entertaining, probably not great places to get your education about the world from. No nope. porn. And that's, and that's the thing. Like, that's, that's essentially what, what Gideon takes away from the first book, except for a big fat hole in her heart. Um, mm-hmm. Or a lung, probably, more likely. Uh, is that she probably knows shit about the world. <laughs> yeah, probably both. Mm-hmm. I don't know how she did. Whatever. She, impaled, she got impaled on the fence. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, again, let's not worry about the logistics of uh, how she died, question mark. Uh, <laughs> But no, I, th I think that's that's the important bit of, of the second, that they essentially show what Gideon could not have been. Yeah. Because she probably wouldn't have functioned there. <laughs> not I mean, that she functions they, elsewhere. <laughs> they also are going... They The second also show like the boneheadedness of inflexibility <laughs> under change. Yeah, that's... that's... Like, that's the other thing, uh, which the eighth also. Uh, it is similar. Eighth show... is more of a deconstruction of fanaticism. Yeah, exactly. And and basically, the second is what Gideon would have been. And the, eighth the eighth is what Harrow. What Harrow would have been. Because, mm -hmm. because by the end of, or by the first book, Harrow is very into the Imperial cult. Uh, well, not even that, but like, Harrow, like. <clears throat> the eighth is religious, like religiously fanatic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so is Harold. As, like the ninth is also, yeah, deeply theocratic. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just that, and I mean that it's... is that is basically part of of Harold's whole thing, uh, apart from from the obvious uh, being a war crime and all that. Like she, oh yeah, we haven't even touched it's... on Harold's origin I mean, story. We will touch on Harrow's stuff later, I assume. But what I want to say here, uh, she, she that's basically one of her issues, is the, that she is deeply religious, for whatever this religion is. Uh, but also, of course, she, when she was very young, very intentionally violated basically the most important rule of her religion. Right, which I think is also well, just... she thinks she did. She technically didn't, but we'll get into that later, too. <laughs> yeah, but also, like, <clears throat> I think the important thing to think about is, like, you know, if we take, you know, the the imperial cult to be a, a, a like Catholic or Catholicism... Yeah. It, oh, it, it does... Look, like, wait, what, John, is, what is, what John is Gaius, the original sin here? Well, the thing is, like, John Gaius knows, is from our modern day. So he almost certainly modeled the religion off of cap Catholicism with John, serial numbers. John is off. probably quite literally about our age. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, like, but I will say, I will mm -hmm. say, like, it is impressive. Like, <clears throat> but like the idea that Harrow as a character is so deeply religious. But also feels like she's committed this great sin and was born a sin, and is also a lesbian. Like that is very clearly <laughs> yeah. what the author is going for. Like it yeah. is as very plain as it can be. Is like you know, Harrow is a character who is who would be deeply conflicted about Basically their faith everything. and how they yeah. like and how they see themselves in it because they've been told that they are both a monster. And inhuman, and also violated the greatest, like did the greatest violation. Yeah, and and that's the thing. Like I, like I can't is... speak from experience there personally. I've never really had a crisis of faith because I'm not a particularly religious person. But the thing is, at that point, Harrow kind of has to ask herself, what it even is she believes in, because it's not the locked tomb, because the tomb has been opened, and she is one of the two people alive who know. So, yep. So basically, what even is her faith at this point? And especially in book two, which we will get into. Right. But by book two, it goes into crazy let, directions. But let, let's let's uh, walk back for a second to yeah. kind of like yeah. explain what book one is like and what it's about, because we haven't really yeah. get, gone into like the base premise yeah, of it. Uh, so basically, um. <sighs> Gideon and Harrow are called to the first house, from the ninth house where they are, um, to uh, study how to become lictors under the tutelage of this dude called Teacher, along with the heirs, uh, the necromantic heirs, and the respective cavaliers from each of the house, each of the houses. So that's two characters per house, yeah. with the exception of the third house, which has three characters because of the twins being the quote unquote dual necromancers of their house. Yeah. And I think I think it's fair to say that 
the apparent plot, let's let's put it like this, is a very, very traditional like knight story. Like the king is looking for new good knights, and there's this tournament where the best elite knights will come out at the end, and they are invited to that, basically. And then the bodies start hitting the floor and it turns into a And then the bodies <laughs> stop dropping, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like the fifth house gets murdered and and you can also read it as like huh. right, and you could but you could also read it as like this is Tamsin Moyers 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 yeah. um, take on the Hunger Games. Mm. Yeah, kind of, kind of ish. Right, like Just you have somehow much. What is it <laughs> like eight? Like some some number of pairs of. Yeah, like some pair, like some number of pairs of people, off, like some of some of them are same sex, some of them are not, competing Especially for a few spots against each other. Yeah, you know, it, it's basically and it's kind of like Hunger Games, right? Meets and like, Agatha is Christie it meets tradition, like meets Star Wars, <laughs> kind of, if you stretch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I think you can say that. It's... With a little bit I of mean, Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, let, we'll get into Eamthe when we get into Eamthe. And like, like a more... <laughs> and like, a more like negative reading of Harry Potter. <laughs> like, this is a like, tradition, like, what if yeah. someone actually wrote Harry Potter to be as, like, was like very clear, like Harry Potter sucks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like that is what yeah, this I series think, is. And I think, think to an extent that it even, especially in the first book, and it might in the later books. We'll see when we get to the speculating. It at least starts selling itself as a as a kind of conventional chosen one narrative as well, because it's like Harrow is the greatest necromancer who has ever been, and no one's as great as necromancy as Harrow, and Gideon is super good with a sword, and damn they are good. And like that's that's chosen one shit right there. Of course it does not at all go that way. Mm -hmm. well, to an extent it does, we'll get to it, but uh <laughs> second book. <laughs> yeah. And um... speculations for as I've said before we started, I think it's easier to speculate on the fourth book than on the third one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll get into that. Uh, something I do want to yeah. note is that like the three characters who could be best described as, quote-unquote, the best necromancer of their generation, all wind up thoroughly broken by the end of this book. Uh, some more literally well. than others. <laughs> Poor Palamides. Yeah. I can't say that. I tell you, buy him a black Hawaiian shirt and instead of like palm leaves, it just has skeleton hands on it. That's, yep. That's the outfit. That's the outfit I want to see him in. Uh. <laughs> oh, yeah. We haven't discussed the individual houses and what they do beyond a couple cursory yeah. bets. So, like, yeah. um, second house is the military house. Third house is like yeah. the, the high class, noble, fancy house. Yeah. Uh, fourth house is yeah. also military, but they're more like. Um, they're more cannon fodder. More cannon fodder, yeah. yeah. Fifth house and sixth like house the, are like the similar. second house. <laughs> I would describe the second house as like navy, mm. and fourth house as infantry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that tracks. Yeah. Fifth and sixth house are both scholarly, though. Fifth house seems to be more inclined toward history, whereas sixth house is more towards like science. Yeah, if I recall correctly. I think you could describe. And whatever you could the describe it as. Yes. You could describe it as like the fifth is is focused on the past. The si like the yeah fifth is focused on the past, sixth on the present, seventh on the future. Mm. Seventh is also really obsessed with people dying though, just like yeah. the beauty of the dying form and all that shit, which is why all of their right. are like super sickly. Seventh, like they're like on the they deliberately cultivate also... genetic defects that cause people to die at a young. Yeah. Like, but they're so they're so convinced about how someone dies is is the most important. Yeah. They are the Byronic house, <laughs> right? But also, like they they fit into this theme of like past, present, future, right? And then, like, yeah, absolutely. 
And then eighth and ninth house are both uh, religious houses, though they have different yeah. forms of zealotry. Essentially, eighth are the eighth are like the religion for for the living, if you will. Though the term living is difficult because technically Wait. everyone is undead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In a way, like I still don't really understand that, but technically everyone is undead. But uh, but the natural basically... state is dead. The natural yeah, state but, is but death. They... But they basically treat it like like Mass Effect treats like amino acids. It's just being dead is essentially the same as alive, just your body runs on a different type of energy. Okay, I don't give a shit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, basically the eighth are the religion for the quote unquote living, and the ninth are the religion for the dead. Mm, right. Yeah, I can see that. Like, the thing of the ninth is is not only the locked tomb, which has a specific significance, we'll probably more get into in the second book, uh, but also just burial. Like right. last and you, you could also read it as like the fifth the the eighth is focused on like it the eighth is how to describe it. It's um traditional. Like eighth is um yeah. What Jack? What's that word I'm thinking of? It's uh, <clears throat> like traditional marriage. Like tra mm. you no, know, it's like the majority yeah. of religion. Yeah, like the uh, mainstream. Yes, orthodoxy. Orthodoxy. That's like it. the the eighth is orthodoxy. The ninth is cult slash like mystery cult slash like cultish. Yeah. Um, or heresy. I is, am ninety yeah. percent sure that the ninth house is ex explicitly described as a cult. Yeah, which, they are the the bone cult, which I think is a fair read. You know, like and you know, also, you have by all appearances, the founder of the ninth house just really liked shopping at Hot Topic, as far as we yeah. know. <laughs> like, yeah, like I assume that's literally canon. I and mean, what's also canon is that, um, uh. Some of Tamsin Muir's notes uh, in the naming glossary are hilarious uh, yes. for several of the characters. Like, she originally uh, planned to name Palamides Di Diomedes, uh, but she changed it just for the sake of a joke Gideon was going to make in the book, where, well, where she called him Sex Pal. I mean, to be fair, wouldn't you... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's just, it's that's perfect. Just good, being a good author, I guess. Uh... No, but but that's the thing. Like that's that's the thing about these books and the seriousness, and at the same time, very overt and kind of juvenile humor that's in them. But it, it just mm -hmm. I like to describe it as a mix of dark, macabre angst and irreverent humor. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, and I think also like. Most of the humor is intensely character based, and that's always important in these things. Like it's not, okay. it's not the author winking at me and going like, "Huh, wasn't that funny?" It's just characters saying dumb shit because they're in a very fucked up situation and kind of need to cope somehow. Right, and like that's the other and thing is works. like, but I think that's also just like how how we all live our lives. Yeah, I mean that's that's why you don't get tonal whiplash reading that because because that's... it's not the book. Winking at you and joking, it's a character making a bad joke in a terrible right. situation. But also, you could just read it as, like, yeah, you know, like, hey, this is just how people in our age group, like the millennial yeah. generation and younger, like, that's just how we talk. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. We a, lot, a lot of the jokes read like shit posts, and that, that is definitely. Yes, very much. Like, how many of us do shit posting on a daily basis? Oh, or just yeah. like cope cope with like really irreverent humor or like humor that, frankly, probably shouldn't be the way we talk. <laughs> mm-hmm. Probably not. And just like you know, we we do it anyway because we have to, because that's the only way to like get through <clears throat> to tomorrow. Yeah, and I think that's like that makes the book just read a lot more honest. Yeah, and that's also a reason why I wonder how this will be talked about in like twenty years, when just probably sensibilities are hopefully much different from what they are today. Mm -hmm. Right. 
I also like do wonder was like if this is going to be held up as a standard, like as an example of how people like wrote books or talk. I think it might. I don't know if it will be just because like just because the big pop culture phenomenon book the way like Harry Potter was or something. I don't think that happens anymore. We're not going to get another Harry Potter anytime. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't, I don't, I just, I mean, I could have said Twilight maybe. And Mm. what I mean is just the, like this book where you kind of, that everyone has read. Like this is not this book. This book is very, for people with very niche interests, but it may as well be because as we've said before, it very much feels like the way people express themselves today. Yeah. Like, I can imagine if this thing got, like, if this series got a big budget adaptation of any kind, which I don't think is likely, but I think it's possible. Who knows? Yeah. Everything's getting an adaptation these days. I think it would be really hard. It'd be very hard to adapt, especially the second book. I I don't think it would be hard to adapt per se, but it would be hard to adapt in a way that is marketable. Mm Mm-hmm. Just because, like... Like I said, especially the, the they second... are in my head, like the way they, they look in my head, you couldn't put any of those characters on a movie poster and people would want to see it. Like it's not I don't know, Gideon has a pretty rocking look. But no, if the yeah, but even if this series does get adapted, it'll be on the TV, not in the movie so... theater. It would have yeah. to be it would also be animated, for sure. Oh, I would love an animated adaptation, but we're getting off track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More like my main thing here is like This is going to be, like, what, you know, like, when people Mm -hmm. talk about, like, like, not everyone's read Edgar Allan Poe. Not everyone has read Asimov. We all talk about it. Like, that is part of the consciousness. But, like, you know, people talk about those books. I think people are going to do the same thing here. Hmm. I don't know if I would go that far, but I I will say I mean, like, in terms of, like... like it would be talked about in in like a literature class or an English yeah, that's, class. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I like, could honestly see Gideon the stuff. Ninth being used as a book to teach people at some point. Yeah, right. that's that, that's what I mean. Like, I think people who do talk about this, uh, like, I don't think quote unquote normal people will just talk about these books. Like, no, I don't think they have the mass appeal for that. But I think even if it won't happen, like, it wouldn't be inappropriate to use these books as essentially studying material for contemporary speech of the 2010 2020s like that feels right because that's w- what they feel like when you read them mm. <clears throat> speaking of though speaking of structure the plot structure of the first book is really fun because uh as we said before it's a murder mystery mm-hmm. and it's not immediately obvious who the killer is or if there's even just one killer <clears throat> Especially once the bodies start hitting the floor. And fun fact, there's multiple. <laughs> yeah, no. Like we said, the fir- the fifth house I mean, gets bumped off basically immediately. I mean, technically, there's the multiple. Sheer, the sheer absurdity of having a murder mystery in a book that is very much built as a book about necromancers is great. Yeah, what makes it really interesting is that, like, oh, hey, we're necromancers. We can just call the souls of the dead to see who murdered them, right? Nope. <laughs> If only it was that easy. Oh, great. <laughs> and then you later find out that the killer was actively scrambling, just playing to keep up with everything. Yep. Which just makes it all the more entertaining in hindsight. I mean, just yeah. the fact that they reveal that, like, it was, a, like, this was just some character desperately playing Xanatos speed chess. Exactly. Yeah. Is excellent on it. I, I do appreciate also, that it's not one of those villains that's like ha ha ha, I had every move planned out down to the milliseconds. Like, No, this person was fucking scrambling from like the get-go. Yeah, but also I think like uh, it, it just shows how bad our main characters are at communicating because just by the nature of her abilities Harrow basically knew what was going on the second she set foot on the planet. And yeah. didn't say anything, which is yeah, exactly. Dumb. She didn't say a fucking word, but she must have known. She must have she had, had an idea at the very least. 
she, she has must to. have known that that the cavalier was dead, was a corpse puppet. Oh no, she, she said as that. much. She said that yeah. she, from the moment she saw him. Like, and like, that's the thing. She, if if she if she were a good communicator, she would just have told. Even if she wouldn't have told Gideon, because she thinks Gideon is an idiot and doesn't really, can't really do anything about. It. She would have told someone, and that would have shortened the book by a lot. Yeah, but like, you know. Her, 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 the fact that Pal didn't know, you know? I mean, Pal yeah, had that's... never met Dulcie in the in person. Yeah, and Yeah, he and like the only like he's the only other character who would have figured it out. Yeah. Him and, and Cam. Essentially emotionally compromised into not figuring it out. Yeah, exactly. It's he, just amazing. Because he knew that she had turned him down already and was like, oh, she's clearly going after this other guy other person that's why she, she's treating me as a stranger it's like no she just does not realize that you have a pre-existing relationship has no idea who you are yeah yeah and like the the best part is that every character thinks that it's just like they just assume and it's hilarious you yeah, know what they say about no assuming your friends end up dead yeah something like and that also other people <laughs> yeah, um, no, like, the killer being revealed as Dulcinea makes so much sense, especially when you, uh, go back and read a lot of the stuff she says, and it's, uh, like, hmm. she never lies. She never does lie, but there's a lot she of half never lied. <laughs> She never lied once in that book. I reread it to check. It's one of those <laughs> technically things. <laughs> There's also a bit of foreshadowing for some reveals in the second book there too, but we'll oh, get yeah, into that in a bit. Great. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna reread it before September, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, what's really fun is that like these books, like I'm coming off of reading the City of Brass trilogy, which is just another series that really puts its characters through the fucking ringer. And, like, that feels so different as a story compared to this one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm part and of like, that, like... And that is, like, not that's even just the language, but, like, it's just such a different vibe, and I love yeah, it. Yeah, the thing, the thing is, I think the thing about, about the Locked Tomb is, like, all of these characters are intensely fucked by life. But even even Gideon and Harrow, who've done horrendous shit to each other, like don't really deserve it. Like it's not it's not their fault, you know? Yeah. Look, I, I mean I, it kind of some of the, some of it is. I mean yeah, and I mean all the interpersonal shit they will have to work out in some way, shape or form, and I honestly <laughs> don't know how they will. But but uh no Very literally I, mean, like, I don't know how they will. I have no idea. I mean, I'm sure they will because it's that we will get into speculating later. Um, what what will be fun? No, very literally, how they will. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I I have I have a few ideas, but uh, no. Yeah. But the thing is, like you were you were saying earlier today that, that in City of Brass, essentially nobody is a good person, and like, but Her both Harrow and Gideon could have been good persons. <laughs> Right, you can tell where their where life things... hadn't so intensely destroyed their lives. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Like even Harrow, who again, especially in the first book, is horrendous. Yep. But she could have been a good person, and she has the potential to be a good person if she only had the time. And there is no time because the plot keeps happening. Yep. Keep in mind that most of the cast in these books are at most in their twenties during the course yeah. of the first book. The only yeah, characters I mean, who are older than that are at are it was nineteen, I think. Yeah. yeah. And like the kids are like what, thirteen, fourteen? Yeah. Yeah. Isaac and John Marie, yeah, they're early teens. That that was like when they when 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 they died, that was so fucking harsh. I was so sad. I was like, no! It was devastating. Yeah. Also, also, like Abigail and Magnus dying sucked, but it was kind of like it's what you expect of a book like this. Like, right, like, especially since they were so undeveloped compared to the rest of the cast. I yeah. mean, obviously, you got to kill mom and dad, right? You got to kill yeah, the mom exactly. and dad. Like, obviously, how it works. 
you make these nice characters so you can kill them. But when like, the but when the children died, that sucked. There was the death like, of the oh fo- fuck, it's one of these books. Shit. The deaths of the fourth yeah. are a real punch in the gut because it stops being yeah. a straight up murder mystery and turns into a dwindling party situation. Yeah. Also, the other thing you have to keep in mind is like, you know, it like it makes the most sense from a narrative standpoint. Like, yeah, who do you who do you kill first? The characters who don't have an whose arc is already done. Magnus yeah. and Abigail already have had their arc. All like, they have the, to lose with each other. Yeah, right. The theor- like theoretically, they're the heroes of a store of like the prequel story. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know. And then, like, you dwindle the party from there. How do you develop? How do you hurt the char- the audience and the characters? The kids, everyone loves. Yeah, that's why they killed Ruin the Hunger Games. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, but um... yeah, it is. It is what you do. Definitely, it's. And again, as a reader, like that was the moment where, like, oh, it's it's one of those books. Yeah. Uh huh. Because because up to that point it could have been like one of those books where children are just untouchable where they get into fucked up situation but that's basically it. No, they die. But no, it's 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 one of the books where children absolutely die. Yeah. Right, and that, like it it's better for that willingness for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What what is funny about this book is like, well, there's like I think like nine or ten characters who bite it in this book. Um, the big bad is only responsible for about half of those. Yeah. Like, everyone else dies to either their own incompetence or someone else ganking them beforehand. Yep. Yeah. Like, uh, so the only ones that we can really blame on the big bad are the deaths of the fifth, the fourth, the seventh, and Gideon. Everyone yeah. else dies because of internal strife and fuckery. Yeah. Both of the eighth die because Silas is a fucking dumbass. I mean, yeah, yep. they die because I mean, that's kind of his whole vibe. Uh, the se- Marta dies because the second are both dumbasses. At same with teacher. Yep. Uh, and the various dies because Ianthe is a backstabbing asshole. Well, Ianthe wants to become a, wants to do the thing. She wants to do the damn thing. Oh yeah, no, look. Anthony, Anthony is a total bitch, but I love her for it. She's amazing as a character. Yeah, I love to hate her. <laughs> yeah, she's the character you go, fuck off. Yeah. Exactly. Also, it does not surprise me the least it's that... It's really uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah? It's not surprise me the least that uh, Tamsin Muir uh, based uh, Anthony at least in part off of the fan interpretation of Draco Malfoy. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Uh, I think it's also just interesting, like, because the Anthem and Corona is just the most interesting relationship to carry forward from what was there in the first book. Mm-hmm. Especially because of how deeply, intensely fucked up it is. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, it's it's really fucked up. It reads like, almost incestuous. Is oh, that, yeah, is exactly. The like, that's the thing. I mean, not literally, almost. Literally, Corona's because, last because, line in the first book is, why didn't she take me instead? Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, that's what I was going to say. Like, Lictorhood is essentially fucking. Yeah, getting married and, like, all the, all the relationship forever stuff. And Corona begrudges her sister that she picked someone else. So it's very <laughs> incestuous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But also, Corona kind of has a thing with Cam and Marta going on now. I don't know. It's all complicated. Uh, Judith, yeah. Uh, Judith, yeah, sorry. I sorry. mean, there's also her just so... doing googly eyes on Gideon, both during the course yeah. of the first book and in that short like, story in the second book. After honestly, dead. Honestly, Corona, Beth, and Gideon fucking would have been hilarious. It would have been yeah. hilarious. Uh Probably wouldn't I have happened, Gideon but it would have been funny as like, hell. Gideon would have been full Ralph Wickham. I'm in trouble there. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm into this, but uh, I'm completely out of my depth. <laughs> Look, one of the most consistently agreed upon things over the course of the book is basically everyone agrees that Corona Beth is hot. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's no one would have blamed Gideon for taking her up on a proposition. <laughs> nope. <laughs> 
even Harold would have been like, oh, I mean... I get it. I'm <laughs> mad, but I get it. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's... That's again. That's the interesting relationship to take forward from the from the first book. Mm -hmm. Besides, of course, Gideon and Harold, which is so intensely fucked up. We should talk about right. the scene, shouldn't we? Which one? Yeah, the pool scene, the one where they have their oh, yes. heart to heart. Yeah, I mean that's that's the that's the that's scene, the big one. Yeah. Because that's like where um, Harrow basically lays her soul bare. Yeah. That's... And basically is, goes full, strike me down with all your hatred. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's the biggest problem. <laughs> Gideon looks down and whispers, no. <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, yeah, Harrow's, Harrow's backstory, of course. Uh, so Look, Harrow is not. Harrow's a baby of genocide, oh. basically. Well, Harrow is I a genocide. I wouldn't call it genocide. I would call it a. Mass I would murder. call it a. It's a mass murder. Yeah. Let's let's call it uh, infanticide on an industrial scale. Mm. Yes. Harrow is the literal product of the mass murder of two hundred infants and children. Yes. Correct. Should have been two hundred and one. Gideon survived. somehow survived. <laughs> that fucking somehow, that's... that's <laughs> we'll get into that. We'll get into Yeah, we will. We will there are reasons that. for that. Yes, and they are basically like the foundation of 90% of my theories for what's to happen in the future. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, but anyway, yeah, but that's like, that's the thing with Harrow. Harrow's Harrow's inner conflict stems from a multitude of facts. The first one being that not only was she conceived as the result of killing 200 babies, which was necessary because her parents needed to... They need to guarantee a necromancer, basically. Yeah, and they were already having trouble conceiving. Yeah, and that's how they did it. And Harrow has been aware of this her whole life. Which is not great, let's say. Mm -hmm. So that's conflict number one. That in this, in this now essentially dying house, because everyone under eighteen except for two people is not there anymore, mm -hmm. and no one had any other children. So now there's basically only old people left. The next youngest person is in his late fifth, uh, his late thirties. Yeah. Oh, Otis. Ortis. Ortis, yeah. Why do you keep calling him Doing... Otis? I don't know. Look, I know it sounds like an appropriate name for him, but still. Um, but no, so that's like that's her one of her many, many huge issues. There's also the whole thing again. opening the locked tomb and performing uh yeah, horror uh spirit sacrilege. That's like, uh that's that's a whole other issue. <laughs> yeah. Like as we said, she's she's part of this religion and essentially like their cult is a, a subsection of of the imperial cult religion whatever and their whole thing is they have this locked tomb and no one really knows what's inside it. All they know is that the emperor says it must remain locked. It must never be opened. Mhm. Mm I wonder why. Yeah, no one knows. Hmm. <laughs> Yes. And essentially, Harrow, not really in a position to cope with the fact that she is 200 dead babies. And, like, li she literally hears them cry. Like, that's... That's I'm the thing. Like, I am 90% yes. sure that Harrow has some sort of schizoid disorder. Because it would yeah, explain but, a lot of her hallucinations. Yeah, but I don't think... Like, I think that is... that or. Let me say, I think it might be literal because, like, they didn't just kind of kill 200 kids. Like, they literally bound the souls of these dead children to Hero. Yeah, no. No, there is a supernatural explanation, but, like, you can also interpret it as, oh, Hero's oh, schizophrenic. Absolutely. 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 Um, but, yeah, so, essentially, wanting to get away from that, Hero decides, well, 
fuck it, I'm going to kill myself. And I'm going to do that by committing the greatest sin imaginable, opening the locked tomb. Which she does. And that's her second big conflict. Because her religion, again, is essentially all about not opening that tomb. And she does just that. He does and the so thing. That you're now, never supposed yeah, so now she is not only, because she's not dead, she's condemned to live on with her status as a war crime, as she so aptly puts it, but also as essentially having committed the biggest sin imaginable. Right. And she has to fucking live with it. Yeah, exactly. She can't get away from it because her attempt at dying didn't really work out. Well, I mean, like, that's also, that's how a lot of these people are. Yes. Like, you know, like, she has to deal with the constant, the sins of her parents. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? I think, I think in a way that's also what, what draws her to Gideon, and has probably always drawn her to Gideon, even, even when they were still treating each other in the most horrible ways. Is like, that, she wants Gideon to hate her, because that will prove it right. It would justify yeah, but, her hit, her self-loathing and her yeah, but, desire but to also, die. But also, Gideon is essentially in the same boat as Harrow. She's completely, like, life has never given her anything. Right. And now, but Harrow's answer to that is to basically run away, to, to try to kill herself, to, to get out of it. To now get Lictorhood and try to redeem herself, like Harrow's answer is to to make it go away, and and Gideon's answer is just defiance. Gideon's answer is to live. Right, and I think that's and I think that's what ultimately draws Harrow to Gideon, that just this this different approach. Right, and just like this idea that like you know there is a there is a different approach. Yeah, exactly. Like, there is another way. <laughs> and Harrow can't conceive of that for herself. No, absolutely not at all. And, and that's that what makes Gideon interesting to her, if you will. Just that, that someone so clearly has a different approach. Right. And, and essentially, I think, I think that's where... How do I best put this? By the end of the first book, essentially that's where they're, and especially going into the second book, their, let's say, miscommunication comes from. Because both of them assume the other one needs something that might not be what they actually need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In short, oh, their relationship these... is so intensely fucked up and codependent. <laughs> yeah, but it, it should be noted here, it is intensely fucked up, but the book is very clear about that it is fucked up. Like, the book is yeah. not, this is a super good relationship and, like... No, it does not idealize the relationship the book, at all. The, 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 book, the book is very clear on the fact that, yes, those two are essentially the romantic leads in this story, but also not the way they are right now, because whatever they have right now is just broken. Mm -hmm. Not even yeah. that. It's just like it. These are two characters. Like it's just very clear. Like these are characters who are troubled. But like, yeah, aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> Like, Though I doubt we're as troubled as these two are. Right, but like Hera, like you know going to like real world application here is just and just theory crafting on my part. You know, like I read these books and often will try to like draw something out. Like a theme or whatever. Um in many ways you could draw like you could read Harrow and Gideon as Harrow is essentially what happens when a kid realizes, oh fuck, my parents are were slave owners and uh -huh. just destroyed people's lives. 
so that I could live. And I have to live with that fact. That is Harrow's story. Yeah. Gideon's is, I am a slave. Mm -hmm. who, can, who can now fight and has to fight to keep going. And like, there, there is that dichotomy there. And like, you could read it as that. And that's deeply fucked. Yeah, I mean, that's also... I mean, that, that also, like, Gideon almost says as much. Like, at some point in the first book, she basically says, all it ever took was for someone to ask. Like, she, she isn't even against being, like, essentially a knight of the ninth house. It's just she wants it to be a choice she made. Right. She and wants... She up wants... Until that point, she never had a choice. Right. Uh -huh. And that's... <laughs> That's what makes the book so good. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I, I have more thoughts on this when we get to the second one, but if we still want to talk about more stuff from the first one, I'm going to... Well, we should also talk about uh, the whole Lichterhood thing real quick, because uh, that's a thing. Yeah. It's such a deeply fucked up thing. Yeah. Yeah, so, we so, so we see out. four four uh four of the necromantic uh, pairing get to the point where they can actually discover Lictorhood, and yeah. of the four, literally the only one that actively goes for it is Ianthe, who is a fucking sociopath. <laughs> and just strips Everyone... thanks for Cav in the back. Yeah. The oh, other ones that the other out. ones are one's already done it. The other the other two find different ways to do it. Yeah. Well, yes. So the thing with um, the thing with Ka with uh, Cam and uh, Palamides is uh, Palamides is like, hmm, interesting. I think I can do this better. Um, Silas is just like, yeah. no, this is hor this is an unholy abomination. This cannot be allowed to happen. And then he. Uh, fights Ianthe and dies because of his own idiocy and not paying attention to teacher's advice earlier. Mm -hmm. Ianthe doesn't even kill him. He just... She just... Uh, he just gets killed because uh, he uh, launched his cavalier soul out of his body and the body got possessed by evil spirits. Mm -hmm. Because the ape is stupid. <laughs> The eighth is intensely stupid. Yes, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Also, I'm pretty sure that um, Silas accidentally sent Colum to hell because we don't see his spirit in the next book, unlike the others. Might be. If we go to hell, I want to see that eighth. I want to see it. <laughs> It'll be interesting. We'll talk about hell and stuff. <laughs> When we talk about the yeah, next I'm book. Yeah, we'll get into that in the second book. <laughs> yeah, um, um, and as for I'm only Hera being slightly facetious. <laughs> as for Hera and Gideon, um, oh boy. they're way too... Hera is just way too dependent on Gideon to willingly commit to the Lictor thing. Which is so funny. Like, which is such <laughs> an interesting, like, thing considering everything else. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Like, there's just something. I mean, it honestly, that might the I can't conceive of a world without you might be the most self-aware thing Harrow says in the whole fucking book. True, valid. Because that's the first time she has a need and clearly voices it. It's just unfortunately not really in the cards at that point. Yep. Ah. <sighs> um. But yeah. So yeah, uh, so the big final oh. fight against Lictor Kitherea. Um, maybe, maybe, I can't maybe believe we haven't to, talked to explain, about Kitherea. To explain really quick, uh, Lictorhood is essentially the necromancer using the Cavalier's soul as an eternal fuel source. Yeah. For pretty for much unlimited necromantic power. Yeah. Mm hmm. That's very, very, uh, a very basic application of what it comes down to. Uh, but yes, it, it turns out 
Yeah, uh, it turns out that um, one of the OG lictors, uh, Kitherea, was uh, was impersonating Dulcinea, and uh, she's been the one behind half the murders in the book. The other half being idiots. Yep. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep calling the second idiots from now on. Like that's just yeah. kind of their vibe. They kind of were idiots. But like that's the thing. Like they're just so dogmatic. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. Like the the biggest idiots are the ones who are the most dogmatic. So the second and the eighth, basically. Yeah. And Hera, we'll wait. <laughs> I mean Yes. <laughs> No, I mean, like, she's an idiot, too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, she's uh, an idiot up until the very end of the second book. Kind of. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm going to say different reason for her idiocy by then, but yes. Uh... <laughs> Look. <sighs> yeah, let's not go into it. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, um, I mean... but yeah. So <laughs> they have essentially this this immortal fighter you to contend with, and pretty much their own one fresh lictor is not enough. <clears throat> they need a second. Yeah, because yep. it should be noted here. I mean, it's more important later, but it should be noted here. Uh, Nabirius, who is essentially Ianthus fuel source, did not go willingly. Yeah, he's kind of pissed off at being murdered, you know? Yeah. And, like, that seems to be a thing. Like, of all the lictors we know, the other ones, like, essentially, it was a willing thing. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's... Like, that's... The, yeah. But, like, also... Uh, like, they're... Like, they make a special note that Gideon... I mean, Harrow is lictorhood is very different. Yeah, well, it's broken. Uh, or not, we well, don't know. <laughs> it like might one, it... one could argue it's the proper way. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, uh, But that too is second book talk. So yeah, essentially Gideon sacrifices herself to to, to force Harrow into lictorhood. And they manage to barely survived the fight, and then Hero meets God. Oh yeah, that meeting with and God it, is certainly something. <laughs> what was and, Hero... it's, and his, oh, and his name mean, is like, John. John. <laughs> John. And, his first word... fuck boy. <laughs> and his first words are, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> yep. I, I Which also... is just... Mwah. Yeah. I love how seemingly humble John is upon introduction. Also fun is Hera literally begging him to undo the lictorhood ritual and give her back Gideon, which is just yeah. so much. Great to God. <laughs> <laughs> which she can't and won't do. Yeah. I mean, he outright says that trying to do it would probably destroy both their souls in the process. Yeah. Which is interesting. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Meaning he's done it before, or at the very least tried. I mean, he probably did, given what we know. Yeah. Um, Adam's... Ugh. We'll Speaking talk about which, it. We should probably move on to the second book at this point. Yeah. I mean, at this point, we've basically talked through the first one. Mm-hmm. And the second book is honestly where it gets brilliant. Second book is fucking weird, man. I I had to restart the second it. book several times because I was like, wait, what fuck. The, what the fuck is going oh, on? <laughs> yeah. Did I, did I miss something? Yeah, same. It was just like, okay, what? Is, what? Second book <laughs> starts in Medias Res and it's literal opening line um, after all, like, the um, for Dramatis Personae is like, pro, uh, like, prologue or chapter one. X hours before the Emperor's murder, and then it, it just throws you right in and it's like, what the fuck? Yeah. The second book is the one book that feels like it's a, it like it's at a ten the entire time. 
and and then the ending starts and it goes into the actual 10 and you're like oh oh shit we got worse we got way worse oh fuck <laughs> so yeah like a good chunk yeah, of the second, second book, book so uh, remember that time Harrow was in the first house with her cavalier orchards and uh, did all these trials That's yeah weird. and and somehow um the third house and the sixth house and uh the second house all got murderized and it's like wait a minute the wrong people got killed this isn't how it ha- is this how it happened this isn't how it's yeah, supposed it, to happen, right? It's a fucking masterclass, honestly, this book. It is literally yeah. gaslighting the readers. Yeah. That's and like I said before. Like if you have the ebooks, like the buying the second one until you're like at that chapter, it should just fuck up your first copy. Like if they could if I if you could bet. do that, it would be the best thing. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, no the like 75% of the second book is just straight up gaslighting the reader. Yeah. And it's Which brilliant. Is, it's exactly how it would happen. Harrow remembers exactly what happened. Harrow remembers, remembers nothing is wrong. Everything is exactly as it was meant to be. Yeah. Isn't that what Abigail said? This is exactly how it happened? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Apparently. so second book starts and pretty quickly you catch on something is very fucked up. Because suddenly it's no longer really narrated in first person, but in second person. And like, uh-huh. you kind of expect to know who it is, but you can't really be sure. You're like, mm, wait, yeah, wait, you know, what's happening? It's not okay. really clear who the, um, who the narrator is until I think the third act. Yeah, that's the thing. Until then it's like, well, it it should be Gideon, but is it? Yeah, and then and, and then, then Hero meets later on, Bella yeah. and the Palamides, and it's like, okay, oh, okay. And, oh, and by the way, Palamides blew himself up towards the end of the first book, so yeah, essentially all that's left of him is a hand. Yeah, no, he he just straight up blew himself to pieces to uh, yeah. damage and continue which, which damaging the Which necromancers can apparently just do. Mm-hmm. I mean, he literally. Mm-hmm. Just as it detonated his energy reserves is what yeah, he describes yeah. as. Yeah. And so yeah, the basically Harrow has these flashbacks to to events that happen but differently. At least as far as we the readers remember. Mm. Partially out of desperation. Yeah. I mean, but but that's not all that's wrong with her because also like her lictorhood doesn't seem to be working properly because everyone else can basically channel their cavalier for for sword fighting duties. To be fair, Harrow's got other problems with sword fighting. <laughs> um, I told you to lift weights. <laughs> One Sorry, uh, <laughs> I could I couldn't resist. It's great. No, it's, it's great. It's perfectly correct. Uh, but no, but I mean that's that's what the book presents to us. Like Harrow has these weird flashbacks that don't really make sense to us because we very clearly remember it happening differently. And right. also, Harrow, yeah, Harrow's sector doesn't work compared to the others. Because by this time, Haru and Iante are basically part of the first house. They have become the Emperor's lictors and live on his ship together with the remaining OGs. Yeah, um, there are only three remaining lictors at this point. Um, yes. Mercy Morn, who is a total mega bitch. Augustine, who seems pleasant enough, but is also kind of occasionally a passive aggressive asshole. And get, I mean, Ortis. Ordus the first, yes. Yes, yes, that's his name. Which definitely name? <laughs> the Saint of Duty, definitely, who is Dower. Definitely not. Definitely not the the first. Nope. <laughs> no, sorry, <laughs> it's definitely about. Ordus. It's always been Ordus. Headache, but... Yeah. Mm. Weird. Thought I had said something. Oh well. Huh. Odd. Um. And yeah, but they can do things Harrow can't do. And no one really knows why. Uh, 
Harrow doesn't really understand. They keep telling her to do stuff that doesn't really make sense to her. Uh, and also, there's a parallel dimension. <laughs> mm-hmm. Ah, oh, yes. There's several. <laughs> well, yes. And that's not even... At least one. The river. Yeah, I meant the river. That's what I mean by several. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true. There's bubbles in the river. Um... No, like this is again. This this is where it goes batshit crazy because so much is happening at the same time. Like you have Harrow's shit going on. You have the flashbacks you, that that do not make any fucking sense. You have you have the river, and the revelation that they are basically interdimensional mega beasts trying to eat the galaxy. Yeah, and it's very like. The books don't say it, but it's very implied what they are. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's a resurrection beast, honey. Thank you. Next. Well, I mean, it's very clear what the resurrection beasts are supposed to be, right? Yeah, no, I, I was quoting the book. Okay. But, like, you guys know what it is, right? They're the it's... souls of the nine planets. Yeah, yeah. they're revenants. Yeah. They're, they're literally revenants of dead planets. Well, the specifically that's, that's the solar also system. the thing. Like, yeah, that's also the thing. Over the course of the of the second book, it becomes increasingly clear that this is not just some science fiction. That this is very specifically set in the future of our reality. Our yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That essentially, John slash God is a nineties kid. Yeah. Nineties or two thousand fucked up. Yeah. Who desperately who, fucked who up. Fucked up super hard. Essentially killed the whole at least solar system. In a Probably very more. We don't, fun, we don't really in, know. A, in a very clear way, too. It's like, oh fuck. fuck. Yeah. <sighs> and then also resurrected the entire solar system, basically. Mm -hmm. And that was like about 10,000 years ago, I think. Yep. Uh, and so yeah, one that, that becomes very clear. So, like again, the 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 logical conclusions are the nine houses are probably the nine planets, which also makes sense with the ninth being like a shitty small rock no one ever travels to well, because what's like interesting is the what? is the counting of resurrection beasts because if I recall correctly, they say there were nine resurrection beasts. Five have been taken down, and there were three left. Which leaves one left over, which makes you wonder what happened to the sixth one. Well, the I think it's isn't, isn't the well, sixth one essentially Gideon's mom? No. So my read on it, and this is getting into speculation, was yeah. I mean, by this point, <laughs> um, is the eighth house. Uh, like you have, essentially, there's eight. There were eight resurrection beasts, right? Oh, there were nine. My take on it was that there were eight, and okay. the ninth one didn't form because the ninth house, the the original ninth lictor didn't do theirs right or did it the right way, mm. the real right way, and. They were sent back to watch over the, the like the locked tomb, and the ninth house isn't on Pluto. It's on Earth's moon that got moved. Interesting theory. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. Because if you think about it, like it doesn't make sense for it to be Plu for it to be Pluto. I mean, it kind of does. Kind of, but not really. I mean, it 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 doesn't. I mean, let me put it like this. I don't know, but uh, the houses are not number two. Of the planets, because no, the first, the one, sixth like, house is definitely the first Mercury. Is, yeah, and the first is definitely Earth. I like to think yes. that the the eighth house is on Uranus, just because of how funny it would be. <laughs> oh man, Gideon is gonna be so sad when she learns there's a planet called Uranus and she didn't grow up on it. Uh, she will be happy though to find out that the eighth house is on Uranus yeah, because she can make so many jokes at their definitely. expense. Definitely. But yeah, like but my you know, 
yeah, the thought is is like these are characters, these are books that like these are char- like these are like there is some weird solar system bullshit happening. Definitely. Like again, it becomes increasingly clear from how people talk and from some very well placed jokes that the original emperor and the original lictors are essentially nineties kids who mm-hmm. somehow fucked up big. Well, John fucked up big. Well, Every- John fucked up big, but everyone else was at least complicit. Yes. <laughs> John <laughs> fucked up so big. Yeah. Oh, very big. big. We'll get into that, though. First, let's get into the lictors and their fucked up dynamics with each other and the newbies. Oh, yeah. Cause, wonderful. Because we know that um, there are only three lictors left of the original batch. And yeah. uh, with Gideon, uh, not with Gideon, with Harrow and Deanthe's edition, there are a total of nine lictors. However, uh, there was supposed to be an eighth lictor before Ianthe. That was Anastasia, who uh, mysteriously did not complete her lictorfoot ritual. That's what I mean. Like, went on to found the ninth house, anyways, which is interesting. Right. I get into that. We get some theory, theory crafting. I just need. I just need to figure it out. It's something I desperately need to know. That's, yeah, the, that's, the, that's the, basically the whole second book. Is you sitting there? I just need to figure this out. The the other three I, I, have long since passed. Are um, Cyrus, U- Ulysses, and Cassiopeia, yeah. uh, and Kithria dies at the end of uh, Gideon the Ninth. And John is yeah, the original that's... lictor. Yes, so that just leaves his uh his three remaining lictors are as Augustine, Mercy Morn, and Ortis. And basically, the 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 common feature among lictors is that they remain the necromancer's body remains, but the necromancer's body has the eyes of the cavalier. Yes. yes. And all of them are still deeply in mourning over their uh, yeah over it, their cavalier. Like all of them are fucked up later. still over being lictors because yeah, mm-hmm. essentially the people they had the closest thinkable emotional bond to they had to kill for their own power to in most cases it was their lover but in the case of Augustine it was his brother instead yeah he would get along well with Corona Mm -hmm. (laughs) probably (laughs) oh there's a lot there (laughs) There, there's just a lot (laughs) so much but yeah, that's that's uh, that's what's going on there, and and also like just the relationships of the remaining lictors are intensely fucked. Their relationships to John are intensely fucked. Like no one is at all healthy. No one, no one, one emotionally healthy way. Yeah, according to John himself, there there were just so many tangled romantic and sexual relationships amongst yeah. lictors over, over there because it was Honestly, spent ten thousand years like, and like it they fe- were the it only feels company like they had. Basically. It feels like basically whenever their relationship got rocky, just someone fucked someone else and started to s- try to smooth it out with that. Look, yeah. John and Is his original very lectures. Clear what's happening here? John and his lectures are the original polycule, all right? Well, the only yes. one involved in that shit was the Saint of Duty, because he was so devoted to his original cavalier. He's he's the token straight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who's on thin fucking ice if you ask someone else? But everyone just kind of dealt with him. He really was. Yeah. I'm not even being facetious. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's entirely correct. Oh my god, I hate that I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, that's also very clearly what's happening in this book. Like, Things are starting to get out of hand, and John is just kind of like, well, I guess it's time for a threesome with my remaining lictors. Oh, that whole scene was a time. Yeah, but but I mean, just think about it. That happens with basically no preamble. It's just they kind of go at it. They're going at it, and it's like, uh, oh, this is steamy. It doesn't seem particularly weird. So we have, like, no one, no one 
pays it any attention, so we have to assume that this basically happens. Fairly regularly. And, and can't really make up, they just fuck. Also, just like, Ianthe and Hero are there, and Ianthe just drags a blue screening like Hero out of the room when this starts. Yeah. Although, let's yep. be fair, Iante is super into the idea of the Lictors just fucking, because she wants to be on top of Hero yeah. very much. Iante mm. and her lust for Hero like, something know. else. Yeah. Uh, there's just a Funnily enough, lot. that's the one that makes me the most uncomfortable. Like, there are many more fuck chips in this series, but this is the one that makes me uncomfortable. Oh, Iante is reason. just a whole deal. On her own. Yeah. Like, there's literally a fanfiction tech content warning, Ianthe. There should be, if there isn't. Because when she's th there is. Because, okay. you know, <laughs> it's her. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Um, but anyway, so Harrow has these letters. Oh, uh, yes. And They're from her past... Yeah, they are oh, clearly letters. written by her because they are written in a cipher she like in her personal cipher. And she has no idea when or how or why she wrote them. She just knows that like all of them essentially have an address on them, like read when X happens or give to Y or whatever. And some of them are impossible. Like one of them reads um open in case of meeting Camilla, who she believes is dead yeah. at this point. Who she's very convinced is dead, yeah. Well, so that's that's basically the red string that carries you through the plot. Like this something about Harrow's immediate past makes no sense at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's just the lens you see all these things through, because like not only does what happens on the ship make no sense to her, because she basically runs into this 10,000-year-old polycule and obviously cannot relate to them at all. I mean, another thing is like, that... How could she? She gets these strange headaches whenever a simple a s certain person's name is mentioned. And she doesn't yeah, understand yeah. why. She always hears it as Ordis, but the mouth flaps don't quite match. Yeah, and it's just... That headache is really annoying. Yeah. Well, that's not... That's a problem for later. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's nothing. Yep. Nothing at Just all. Just the general stress, like, he's her trainer and she's not, like, on great terms with him. I'm sure it's just stress. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> maybe she should lift some weights. Who yeah, knows? Maybe she, maybe she should. Uh, but so, anyway, so what, what essentially is happening, even though Harrow's... Lictorhood skills don't really work, at least not the way they're supposed to. Basically, what the Lictors are doing is, on behalf of the Emperor, the Emperor is apparently fighting a war against, essentially, against non-necromantic systems. Is the way I understand it. Yeah, apparently he's waging some sort of revenge war for them abandoning yeah. the Earth. During... Something like that, yeah. That's the most we can glean, at least from what's yeah. said in the book. And basically what he's using his lictors for is go to a planet he wants to or that should that is to be attacked in the near future. And they well, call it turning it. And essentially what they're doing is instead of putting out life energy, the planet starts putting out necromantic energy. And once that is happening, necromancers can do their shit and well, that's a huge military advantage. And so that's why the lictors, including Harrow, uh, do traveling. They travel to different planets to do that. They also do dimensional traveling because there is this alternate dimension called the river, which is essentially the afterlife. Like, or some approximation thereof. <laughs> I don't know yes. if you guys got this, but like I read that. Like when I read that, I was like, this sounds a lot like. Uh... Warhammer 40k space travel. <laughs> Never that played was kind of my, my, my first association was just the River Styx because it's a river. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. fair. But like, um, my 
the vibe I got was was very like Warhammer. Yeah, I mean, Warhammer has its fingerprints. I mean, Warhammer also species. feels very similar. Like you have an ancient god king who yeah. is the most powerful person alive, or mm-hmm. slash. Uh, that's the one like, Dune intersection. <laughs> it's just there's a lot there's a lot of similarities in that like, yeah. overarching structure. Yeah. So anyway, on on one of these planets, H- Harrow meets uh, Camilla, who's supposed to be dead. Yeah. Right. And that's that's basically when things start happening. Yep. Yep. Not so that there she... weren't a shit ton of things happening up to that point, but that's it's when the narrative really kicks into gear. Yeah. I mean, that's at like, some point oh, we got to relate it to the final, to the former book. I mean, at some point we got to eat some soup. <laughs> yeah, eat some soup. <laughs> yes. Um. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, yeah. But her meeting Camilla leaves Camilla to asking, hey, uh, I have some of the bone fragments of my dead necro. You think you can communicate him- with him since he's floating in the river? And it's like, I can try. <laughs> and lo and behold, she meets Palamides, who <laughs> is stuck in a room reading a single romance novel over and over and over again. I love him so much. He's a good kid. I love Pal. He's great. <laughs> Poor man needs a second book. I know. Poor man just needs writing a writing a second book. <laughs> yeah, so... Hon- I mean, honestly, though, <clears throat> if you can't, if you don't have a book, write it yourself. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> that's what He's smart enough. All about, and uh, there's more than enough fan fiction in this book. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah so <laughs> she meets Palamides and is like, okay, so there's some crazy shit going on. Mind explaining things? Sorry, can't really explain too much. Oh, hey, there's something interesting going on. Uh, you're being and haunted. Then he turns to the reader, <laughs> <laughs> basically. Yeah. And it's like, no, oh, hey, the narrator was actually an actual narr- a character in the book. Yeah. Is like, like, hey, you're here. Hmm, I wonder who it could be. Yeah. Stares at camera. <laughs> it's like yeah, Dora and... the Explorer. <laughs> yeah. Who is it? No, and at, at this point, I mean, not that it wasn't clear at this point, but at this point it becomes very, very clear that something is super fucked. Like, there's more, things, there's more things wrong than it than not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Things don't fit into each other where they should. And things get weirder when uh when Harrow comes across both Judith and Corona Beth in addition to uh Camilla. It's like, oh wait, yeah. hold on, well, I have letters. Pick, <laughs> they come pick her up. They come pick Camilla yeah. up. Yeah. I, I just love that they wait for her to pull out her letters to read them through. And she immediately locks both Corona and Judith's jaws shut. Yep. (laughs) Like, they can't even protest for anything. Nope. I think Judith gets a single line out, and Corona Beth doesn't say a damn thing. Well, I mean, also, like, let's be honest, uh, Harrow probably doesn't really like Judith all that much for being an idiot. Understandably, he doesn't like Corona, Corona Beth, because, because of how much he was coming onto Ortis. Yep. Yes, or- Ortis. Ortis. Definitely Ortis. <laughs> Definitely Ortis. Definitely Ortis. Ignore what we said earlier in this in this stream. It was definitely Ortis she was coming onto, and not someone whose name starts. That is with G. what we said. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, right. Uh, Come on. What else would we say? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So she meets three people she thinks are dead. And shit's fucked. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fucking fucked. fucked. Yeah, it's mean, basically. Oh. oh, there's also this little bit we get when uh, she, when Harrow looks into the ship and sees a vaguely familiar looking poster of this older woman whom she definitely has yeah, never weird. met before. But like, there's something vaguely familiar about familiar. her. Ah, ah, that's that headache again. <laughs> this book um, fucking slates you so fucking hard. Yeah, it's it's so good. 
Yeah, so so in addition to all the things being fucked up with Harrow, we also learn that essentially the universe is about to collapse more or less. Like mm -hmm. we're about to hit like singularity level kind of things here. Yeah. Yep. Because the resurrection beasts are basically trying to pull the whole universe into the afterlife. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I don't blame them. I mean, <laughs> at that point. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as I as I said, a lot of shit going on in this book. At the same time, that's not really time to breathe for anyone. Yeah. Um, Which, I mean, I think it's amidst all of this, we are getting uh, Harrow's uh, updated flashbacks to what happened at Cannon House, and those are also a time. Yeah. yeah they're great. I mean, nothing's wrong. Great. Wasn't Nothing it is when, when Harrow was a cavalier and was picked to be. Uh, no, no, no that, that's, a, that's a bit later. That's a bit later. Okay. We, we still need to talk a about uh, all the stuff with uh, Ordis and his epic slam poetry, his epic poetry. Oh my I mean, god, that's his thing. He writes. He's oh, a writer. Like Eighteen book every... epic, apparently. Like his fucking fan fiction. Because that's what it is. He's a good Christian. boy, and I will not accept any slander of my good boy. We're not slandering him. We're talking about his his amazing uh, eighteen book fan fiction epic. Yeah, which is very important to him, as it should be. It's something he poured a lot of his soul into. No pun very me. much. Ah. <laughs> uh. uh. Yeah, that's that's basically the thing. Like Harrow's Cavalier, who has always been Ortis and never anyone else, doesn't really doesn't really want to do all those fucking trials in the flashbacks because he kind of just wants to write. And most people are just eager to let him accept Harrow. Yeah. Like, Harold, just give the guy a break. Jesus. Yeah, let, let a man write his fanfiction, man. Can't a um... man write in peace? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, none of this should be taken as, like, disparaging fanfiction in any way. Like, no, no. It's very clearly this... what it is, but, but Tamsin Muir obviously has a lot of love for fanfiction. She has a background in fan fiction, apparently. Yeah, I, she she has written a lot of, I think, like Homestuck stuff or something. Mm -hmm. Oh, Homestuck! Homestuck yeah. really made this world. I did. Oh, boy. I did or not? Um, so no, I think, uh, yeah, she has a clear love of fan fiction, and it shows with Ortis and also later in this very book. Um, but that is also a point we'll get to. The the plot. What's the actual plot at this point? Where are we? Where were uh, we? We're, we're in Act 3, which is uh, when... Uh, yeah. Oh, we haven't talked about uh, the Saint of Duty and his repeated attempts to kill Harrow. Yeah, that's that's basically his whole thing. Like He tries to I... get the sword fight into her yep. by, by basically shocking her into her, like, what do you call it, like, cavalier state. Yeah. And uh, eventually... Uh, he ambushes her while she's in the bath, and uh, she realizes, oh, hey, he can just absorb the energy. Yeah. He just absorbs the energy. It's really energy. fucked up. Like, on, on many, many levels, it's really fucked up that he does that. But yep. it should be noted, nothing works. Like, it is apparently impossible for Harrow to, to give over the reins to her lictor, yeah. uh, to her cavalier. Which makes sense. Ortis doesn't want a sword fight. He just want to, wants to write. Well, yeah, let him let him write. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah, after uh, the attempt on her life while she's in the bath, she just goes several days without sleep. And then uh, at uh, the insistence it's of... It's great Bolt, if you're already like stressed and paranoid, just not sleeping for a few days. Yep. Yeah. Perfect solution. But the insistence of both Ianthe and John, she's like, you know what? I'll make dinner. Let's make soup. Soup sounds nice. Yeah, super oh, this, this is super <laughs> delicious. 
and then she makes soup. Like this is this was some red wedding shit. <laughs> when I read this, I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, she, she, yeah so whatever. she put her own bone marrow into the soup as yeah. stock, and then she and then after uses necromancy. She punches a hole in the sand of duty's gut with some bones generated out of her marrow. Yeah, which is like wonderful. Yeah, she nearly it's kills not- the guy too uh, before uh, John intervenes. Which is very hard. Like, lictors are not easy to kill, and she almost does it. Mm-hmm. It's pretty impressive, honestly. She almost kills everyone at the table. Yeah. Uh, the only one she manifests right. a skeleton in is uh, is Ortis. She doesn't try it on anyone else, I don't believe. But she could have accidentally done it on, as collateral damage if she wasn't paying attention. Hello, Mr. Tiny yeah. Corn Dog. <laughs> But yes, um, yeah, uh, John realizes what is like, what the fuck? <laughs> Everyone's like, what the fuck? But John's like, well, this is well, the first well, time in quite a long time that I've, I've consumed human remains. I was like, the hell? Thanks for that's that information. Of, that's <laughs> a lot of questions. That answers a lot more questions than it does. <laughs> that, that raises so many questions. I have several yeah, questions. I mean... I mean, does it really raise questions? Are you really surprised? No. <laughs> no. I mean, basically, from putting together what was going on in the first book and what we learn in this book is that John and the other lictors were researching necromancy, and in the course of that, the big fuck up happened. Mm-hmm. A lot of big fuck ups happened. Like, John did not set out to become like God Emperor. He just researched necromancy, killed everyone, resurrected everyone, and then he was the God Emperor. Mm hmm. Yeah. And he might not be super qualified to be that. No. Oh, there is a lot wrong with <laughs> no. John. Which we will get into in a yeah. bit. A lot of it, yeah. A yeah, lot of it is. Uh... It's like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, we also haven't oh, talked yeah. about how Kithra's corpse is uh, apparently uh, up and about and haunting uh, and haunting Harrow. Yeah. And also, uh, uh, apparently at one point tries to kill Ortis. Mm-hmm. For very normal reasons, obviously. Yes, obviously. Yes. Ortis doesn't even remember it happening, so it's clearly something normal happened, right? Clearly. That's stuff. <sighs> yeah, so soup. Uh, soup. Delicious. After, after, after the soup. Oh, God. I can't even remember. Honestly, this book is such a blur. Yeah, that's the thing. So much shit happens all the time. Uh, I it's... believe that at one point, uh, I think either shortly before or shortly after the soup, um, Harold regrows Anthe's arm in a very yeah. sexually charged scene. Yeah. It's... Yeah, I mean, that's essentially what it is. Yeah. Yeah, basically, Anthe has lost her arm and needs the new she, one. She lost it in the in at the end of the first the book. First book, yeah. Yeah, uh, the right. Hero makes her. Hero makes her uh, a golden bone arm. Oh no, she just makes a regular bo- uh, bone arm. I mean, yeah. Uh, Anthe dips Yanthe it in gold. Dips it in gold because because that's metal as fuck. Really, really and also strong. because that's totally something Anthe would do. Yeah. Again, pretty extra. Um, Honestly, Anthe is probably the most flamboyant character in the book, and that's saying something. (laughs) That's saying something on the same spaceship as fucking John. Uh, Look, everyone on that spaceship is is extra as fuck, except for maybe Ortis. Yeah. Ortis just wants to do his job, man. He is the same duty. unfortunately, is killing Hero, but... uh, Yes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> or, well, not killing her, but that's his method. 
There's so much there. Yeah. There's just so much going on. But so yeah, after on. after the whole soup thing, uh things start going belly up as Pretty as expected. Good. And um uh it ultimately leads uh as the resurrection beast gets closer to uh the space station that all the electors are on. It's like, okay, uh, our time's running out. We need to strategize, kill some planets, all that jazz. And then uh, the beast arrives and it's like, okay, so Hero, you stay on the space station because if you go into the river, you will die. Well, the rest of us handle this thing in the river. Uh, That's the only place you can kill one of these things, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically how you kill resurrection beasts is by fighting them in the river. Yeah. Which is not great because when you die there, it's pretty. pretty yeah, violent. and two of the last three lictors who died died trying to kill a resurrection beast in the river. The yeah. third one dragged the resurrection beast into a fucking black hole. Well, shit happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, and so ostensibly the plan is the lictors and John go down. No, John Fight stays. Resurrection beast. Oh no, John stays behind, right? But and... most electors do not follow through on that and come back to the space station, yeah. leaving uh, Ordis on his own. The responsible For thing to real? do, clearly. You know who's no longer really on the space station by this point? Who? Arrow. <laughs> oh yeah, because uh, Mercy <laughs> cures her, yeah. and uh, guess who takes over? But. Ta-da! It's Gideon. Gideon is back. And she's just like, motherfucker, couldn't you have at least tried to lift weights? Who, at this point, it becomes clear, was the narrator up to this point? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I just love love Gideon returning to the plot in force. It's just such a great moment. And just... uh, Yeah. Yeah, just just to explain, like it gets actually explained later, but essentially, when Harrow arrived, or after Harrow's talk with God at the end of the first book, Gideon's soul wasn't entirely consumed yet, and basically Harrow lobotomized herself to be essentially unable to even think of Gideon. And Gideon takes this entirely the wrong way. Yes, because as we know, the two cannot fucking communicate. Gideon Gideon takes takes a a rejection of her ultimate ultimate rejection. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas it's actually tried to give you everything, and you didn't even want it. Yes. Whereas Harrow takes it as her selfless gesture of saving Gideon, because if she hadn't done this, Gideon would have been gone. Consumed. Yeah. But, you know, neither of these people can emote in a healthy way, so here we are. Mm. Mm-hmm. If only if only they could. <laughs> and, yeah, but oh, they yeah. would never. They, they would never be caught dead doing so. Yes. <laughs> oh, and also, those flashbacks to uh, what quote-unquote really happened to Cannon House, that's actually uh, Harrow pulling the souls of the people who died in there to... Uh, yeah. Into a fake world to kind of oh, everyone who was there was basically actually there. Mm-hmm. All the dead ones from the first book, including Ortis. Oh yeah, let's go into the montage of the AUs because that was fun. That's <laughs> the best fucking bit. Yeah, so these flashbacks get basically more unstable over time because uh, Harrow's hold on what she deems to be reality is waning, mm-hmm. uh, as a tradition. Yes, you do. And essentially her mind just makes up increasingly off scenarios of what happened, but it's no longer about what happened. It's it's about her meeting Gideon because her mind is getting ever closer to the point. Okay, to explain, the Lictors have basically a healing factor. They have like Wolverine superpowers. And her self-lobotomizing is just not forever. It's healing itself, her brain. Mm-hmm. And as her brain gets closer to being able to process Gideon again, she gets these increasingly weird visions, which are all about her meeting Gideon. But because her brain is not there yet, uh, Abigail shuts her down every time. 
Yep. With increasing, like, she's increasingly annoyed. First yeah. one's like, this is the, not how it happened. And the third one is just, nope. <laughs> like, the first, which one's the first what one? The first, one what was, first one is the role the first swap one, AU. The first, one, the first one is the role swap AU, exactly. Like, all of these visions are fanfic. Like, like yeah, very they're, they're common off. fanfic AUs. Yeah, the yeah, best so, kind of fanfic, though. Yeah. Yeah, so Six the first one's a role swap. swap. Uh, second yeah. one is the uh, Royal Ball. Oh. Yes, which is just great. And the third one's the coffee shop AU. Uh, a short, a short um, heads up. The royal ball implies that at that point in time, Harrow is at least subconsciously aware of Gideon's heritage. Either that, or she filled in the blanks to just make Gideon the royal princess or some shit. Yeah, but. But wh- like, why would she? I my my because she she wants to hook up with Gideon, obviously. That flashback is basically what happens at the time Gideon learns. Hmm, that could be it. I don't know, like, this is again yeah. it's just it implies that Harrow knows something she shouldn't know at this point. Mm. Or like, or that Harrow like has some awareness based on meeting John. Like some subconscious also, free. Also possible. But yeah, what we're hinting at here without saying it is it turns out John slash God is Gideon's dad. And that makes G- Gideon Jesus Christ. Yes, Gideon lesbian is space lesbian space Jesus. Jesus. My co pilot. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I love this twist so much. It's great. I love this. Also, the John, to John it too. didn't know he had a child because they, they stole his seed. Yeah, they also think that uh, Gideon is uh, died because her mom died in the process of leaving yes. orbit, and it's like her mom. So died. when when they say it, it's like, oh, so my child is dead. It's like Gideon then chooses that moment to introduce herself. Like I'm not fucking dead, and John replies, "Hi, not fucking dead. I'm dad." Best Just, dad joke ever. Best dad so joke ever. <laughs> Flawless so application of a dad flawless joke. Flawless delivery. Perfect. Yeah. No notes. I mean, John is unintentionally or intentionally the funniest character in this series. Oh, yeah. I think so much is hilarious I about him. John just thinks nothing can touch him. And I mean, for I the mean, most part, he's right. I mean, based on the way the book ends, yeah. yeah. Correct. Uh, but I, I but love the, the bit like with this, uh, this him... Reveal, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. I was going to actually make a point. <laughs> so if you just want to say something funny, uh, say it. A bit where he uh, says Commander Wake's full name, and it's just yeah, like wonderful. So, what do you think of the name of these dead cultures? Like a bit sad, bordering on kind of funny. Yeah, because it's literally um, a wake remembrance of the these forgotten dead. Um, Kia hua kote pa, snap back to reality, oops, reality. there goes gravity. Oops, there goes gravity. <laughs> and then later he says, Commander, wake me up inside, sorry if I got that wrong. Yeah. Which, again, implies 90s kids, very, very much implies 90s kids. Yep. Oh, yeah. That music will not live that long. <laughs> <laughs> no, or, yeah. the, or it will, and it's hilarious. Yes. Yeah. To be fair, Stop. all of us love the Avril Lavigne, to be fair. Wake me up inside is Evanescence. Right, but like we, it's in that same genre. It's in that same generation, yes. Yeah. But what I was going to say, um, this reveal obviously puts things in very, very new perspectives because uh, essentially throughout the book, John and Harrow have had little therapy sessions, talks, call them what you will. And at one point, Harrow confesses that she committed the greatest and biggest sin of opening the locked tomb. And John says, no, you didn't. You can't. Like, there are, there, are, there are wards on the tomb that mean only I can open it. They are, they are locked to my DNA. It cannot be opened. And it turns out that Hera opened the locked tomb while she had Gideon's blood on her fingernails. Yes, that's exactly what happens. And but at the time of the conversation... Why Gideon, like, that is why Gideon exists. 
They yes. stole his seed to make a child with his DNA to open the locked tomb to overthrow him, specifically as a method of rebellion. Mm -hmm. Because Wake, one of the original lictors, was no longer going to let this shit fly. Wake was not lictor. No. Oh, no, she yeah. was the... No, she wasn't. Yeah, no, she wasn't. She was just the... She's, she's the commander of Blood of Eden. Yeah, yes. Which is the, the uh, opposing force to the... The main opposing force to the Empire. Yes, my, my bad. <laughs> Though, they admittedly, are. two lictors are involved in trying to overthrow John. Everyone, yeah, she, she it's like with, everyone is everyone but Yanthi is essentially part of the the Children of Eden at this point. No, uh, um, what was it? Not... it well, mercy? oh, we we haven't even gotten into uh, well, Gid Gideon the First, aka yeah, the guy course, we've been calling Ordus this whole time. That's his name is Gideon. Gideon got her name from him. Yeah, because it turns out OG Gideon because of him of uh, was one of Commander Wake's former lovers. Yes. Holy you. Because <laughs> it turns out that Wake's other former lover is sharing a body with Gideon, and it's Gideon's former lictor, uh, Pira right. Deve. They, yes. I mean, like to be fair, Pira is apparently a snack. Apparently. Oh, she yeah. was apparently a silver fox. But but it should be noted, Pyrrha and Gideon have a weird lictor, because Pyrrha still exists. Right. They're yeah. also a perfect lictor. Yeah, so we have uh, two and a half examples of a perfect lictorhood by the end of the second book, which is um, Gideon and Pyrrha, Camilla and Palamides, and sort of Harrow and Gideon. Yeah. And the yeah, perfect lictorhood is basically this idea that you become a lictor without killing the cavalier. Like the cavalier's soul stays intact. And this is another part where many of my speculations set in. <clears throat> but yeah, it's it's very very apparent that the normal lictorhood process, which consumes the cavalier, is flawed. Mm -hmm. It's intentionally flawed because of John. Yes, because because John John knew there was a better way, but he didn't want to share that knowledge because it would have uh, been bad for him. Because yeah. he he's actually a power hungry monster. Yeah, because he does, and he's not big on accountability. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Almost had like this to book be is an... trying to tell us something. <laughs> yeah, he would have had to be an equal to all these people instead of uh, being their actual superior. Yeah. Well, he doesn't, something... he doesn't even care about that, even. No. There is something just... weird about his abilities beyond the whole Lictorhood thing, because he has some weird, funky time shit going on, too. Yeah. He also Which has, is like, not necromancy. Like, his eyes are completely black. Yeah, except for that Which... little white ring. And yeah. uh, based off of Which... what we learn about Perfect Lictorhood... Those are the eyes of his Cavalier Electo. Exactly, exactly. Those are Electo's eyes. And Electo is... Is Electo what's in the tomb? I don't really... Yes. Electo Probably, in the yes. For there all have, we I've know, seen Electo theories. is what's in the tomb. I've seen yeah. theories that's Anastasia instead of Electo. Yeah, but I assume it's Electo. Like, that makes it has really to be sense. Electo. It's almost it certainly... Because, yes. because basically, John's original Cavalier Electo was... Like probably it, had some sort of mental illness, or there was something off about her. her that they called yeah. her inhuman was like one of the things. Yeah, like it's it's not really clear what was wrong with her, but she had some weird shit going on, and that that influences the quite apparently influenced the the process of of lictorhood. Like one could argue, like there's my theory. And again, my theory uh, is that, you know, Electo is actually a demon. Hmm, interesting. Might be the ninth resurrection beast. Right. That could be. Or might John's... at least be re related to it in some shape. Right. Oh, we or haven't even just... talked about the incredible... Uh... 
fuck up this that is like the whole thing going on with Mercy Moore and uh, the two different polycules that intersect to create Gideon. Yeah. So like Mercy, Augustine, and John is one, and Wake, Pira, and uh, Gideon the first as the other. Yeah. It is kind of funny to me that uh, Gideon was produced by two different polycules together, and I, neither of her parents are from the same polycule. Yeah, and all of them want John dead. Mm -hmm. Except for John himself. <laughs> yes. I mean, does, like, kinda. Except Gideon the first. <laughs> Gideon the first doesn't really care. Yeah, he's just no, doing his job. Man. Also, let's be honest, John kinda wants John dead. I mean, yeah, kind of, but not. I mean, John's a fuck. That's really all I can say. The issue yeah. with John dying is that apparently it would turn the sun into a black hole and kill everyone in the nine houses. Yeah. It kind of did. Already. Yeah. Mercy I mean, Morin briefly goads him, and uh, he, he, he literally has to spend several minutes doing damage to scroll before uh, reconstituting himself. Yeah. Not, it's, not, it's not great. It's, it's not great. It's not pretty. It has no. to be said. Not, not good. So yeah, lots of shit going on in this book. <laughs> yeah, and uh, John just basically immediately kills the Mercy Morn after reconstituting himself, doesn't he? Yeah. Yes. Without even so much as a word. He just it's nope, done with that shit. And then he's like no Yeah, he's no just like chances. He's like, okay, all the rest of you either kneel or die. Except you, uh, except you, Gideon. You're my kid. Be really awkward, really gauche if I killed you the first day we met. Alright, everyone else, line up. Tomorrow, though, you're fair game. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's the thing. Like, the, like, his attitude towards Gideon is completely fucked. Like, it's not... Oh, it's hilariously no. awful. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. Because, yeah. because, like, as, 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 as stupid as that sounds in this context, he does that thing where he just thinks, okay, guess I'm going to insert myself into this person's life and she's going to be super great. She's going to be super cool with that. And like, it turns out that that's and, not the case. No, and Gideon, is, the second she meets him, she's like, no. Gideon kind of no, hates his guts. Away. Yeah. Justifiable. Yeah. She's outright mad when uh, when Ianthe saves <clears throat> saves his ass later on. Yeah. Though speaking of Ianthe, she is actually apparently briefly horrified by learning that John dying means the whole uh, of the nine houses yeah. dying. Because that's where her stuff is. Yes, exactly. and the only person she cares about, her sister. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Uh. No, but I mean, but Ianthe also, like, it doesn't really hurt her to, to pick John's side. She does so very easily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, I love the conversation Ianthe has with uh, Gideon. Like, it's so as soon as G Gideon shows up in the book, he's like, oh, it's you. Yeah. <laughs> and then Gideon just goes on a rant like, oh, yeah, she's all into bones. Yeah. No Speaking chance, of which... Sorry. Okay, I have to mention this. I have yeah, to. Yeah, go, go. It's, Gideon it's is been a while, but go. Gideon is trying to get Hero's affection. No, not Gideon. Ianthe is trying to get Hero's affections. She's her only competition <laughs> is two dead chicks, and she's still fucking losing. Yeah, yep. and she's still third. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, is hilarious. Such a good time. That's I mean, at this point, we're still going to go back to what's actually happening in the book, but at this point, we kind of also have to talk about possible implications for the future and where things might go. Um, so, yeah, to quickly explain the two dead chicks, obviously one is Gideon. The other one is when Harrow originally opened the tomb. Yes, the yep. body. She, she saw presumably Electo. Correct. And essentially fell in love with her, love at first sight. Yep. It's hard to parse uh, Electo's feelings on the matter, considering she doesn't seem to uh, 
be particularly responsive. <laughs> but she is, and her feelings on the subject seem to be, I can work with this. Yep. Yes. Uh, <laughs> in, in the or meantime, like, G- Gideon is like, uh, oh yeah, yeah, Harrow's not interested in you or me. She's interested in uh, yeah. the body. And I was like, by this point, it's pretty clear that Harrow is wanting to uh, get with Gideon. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I think if you if you want to put it in very simple terms that don't really uh, Look, adequately portray the gravity of the whole thing, but still fit. I very think, grossly like, oversimplified, she... but that is the yeah, gist of it. Essentially, she has kind of a crush on the body. It's like, ooh, what's this? She is really but, deeply enamored with the body, but she seems yeah. to be developing a genuine love for Gideon what she, at this yeah, point. Yeah, like there's there's actually emotional investment there with Gideon. Right. To to put it in very 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 cliche terms, is she's in love with the idea of the body because it's obviously something she can't have, someone who he, who she can basically project onto because someone who can't dead. Re- yeah, someone who can't reject her when. All her life, all she has known is rejection. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I think that's who else, who else could she love? But the the greatest played. criminal in the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think this is. It's very likely that that's how it will play out. That basically, like she doesn't get over the body or anything, but that that's just something unrealistic for, her, and she knows that and. Yeah, whatever she's developing for Gideon is real. It's like an actual thing. We have not yet mentioned that concurrent to this, Harrow is off in the dream world, fighting against First Wake, then the Resurrection Beast, with the help yes. of the dead, like uh, the dead necromancers and cavaliers, as and well as a certain Matthias Nonius, who got summoned through the power of poetic fanfic. Yes. That's Which just, is fucking. That is literally what happens. <laughs> yep. Correct. <laughs> Keep in mind that this guy's yeah. dead for a thousand years, and uh, yeah. literally just from or the just, power. His fanfic is so good that his soul came back to the river. Just Isn't he like supposed to be a contemporary of like the like the first, like yes, the, le- yes, the original yes. lectures? No, he he uh, was um, he was like a thousand years ago or something. Yeah, but he did he fight was, alongside uh, Gideon the first at one point. Yeah. Okay. I was like, I'm pretty sure he is like a contemporary, but like no, he was very no, close. He's, not, he's no. not like a contemporary of Anastasius or anything. But he he was around a while ago. I do love yeah. the bit where it's like, why am I speaking in verse? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> perfect iambic too. Fanfic. Yeah. Well, good fanfic. Uh, I mean, honestly. Yeah. Also, also, we also haven't. Yeah, we all we also haven't mentioned the insect aliens yet. What? Oh, those fucking terrifying things! I missed that part. Oh, it, no, that's, it's the that's, the that's heralds of Gideon resurrection. First resurfaces. Yeah. I forgot about that. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, those things are terrifying. Yeah, that like that's that's the other problem. Like John is not only dealing with resurrection beasts. There's also literal aliens. Trying to invade. Yeah, well, he's the got the aliens. Thing. He's got the blood of Eden. Yes. Yeah. And he has resurrection beasts. Well, yeah, the, 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 the aliens are basically offshoots of the resurrection beasts. Yeah, they they attack because of the resurrection beast at least. Oh, that's right. Okay, I was like, yeah, I didn't remember aliens. I feel like I would remember that. No, they they are oh, little. That's... They are literal spawn of resurrection base, if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah that's correct. That's right. Yeah, and they are wasp shaped. At least the ones for for the seven, uh, for number seven are. We don't know what the yeah. uh, ones for the like, other. Don't ones they are like? Are. Don't they take the form of something? Like that, they take different forms of what you're afraid of. Something like that. Uh, also, but that doesn't really make sense because neither Gideon nor Hero would know what the fuck a wasp is. Mm. I mean, to be fair, flying bug thing. <laughs> also, um, yeah, so at this point, uh, Gideon, OG Gideon is the only one fighting the Resurrection Beast. But uh, yes. after beating Wake, uh, 
the dead cavaliers go to help hit, uh, help OG Gideon fight the beast and drive it off. Which is pretty damn awesome. I wish we got to see that on page, but at the same time, like... I get it. So much I get, going on. <laughs> yeah, there's so much happening already. Yeah, um, Abigail and Dulcinea se- wa- uh, send uh, Harrow on her way, and she wakes up in a tomb somewhere. Our way. With nothing to keep her company but a sword... And um, an issue of Frontline Titties of the Fifth. Which isn't even a real publication. Unfortunately. <laughs> I just love the wistful way she uh, says that yeah. when she finds the magazine. That's a really ni- de- nice detail. Yeah. She, w- she knows what she wants and she wants what she wants. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, um... <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, and, and we have still left out like three plot threads. We've left out so because there's just there's so much in these in books. Book. The second book has a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, as I said, it, it it feels like it's at a ten all the time, and then the ending happens, and you're like, oh shit! Everything gets kicked up to eleven. Yeah. Oh fuck! There's more. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, the reason. The whole reason the the lecturers finally turn on John is like discovering Gideon's eyes and being like, "Wait a minute, these are what are these eyes doing in uh, Hera's body? Th- they're, those are her calves' eyes." John, John, what those the are f- your eyes? What's going on here? John, what's going on? Yeah, what's and that's going on, John? How they learn about perfect lecturehood, and mm-hmm. they are like, hmm, "Great." Okay, so uh, and. Mercy tries to kill him by blowing up his body, and Augusty tries to kill him by sinking the entire fucking space station into the fucking river. Into hell. Yeah. Yeah. Literal hell. Yeah. And he Neither almost works. succeeds, too. Uh, Yanthe winds up saving the Emperor at the last minute. Yeah. And I think Augustine gets dragged off to hell. It's kind of unclear. We never yeah, did find the body. It was unclear. <laughs> you know, it was really unclear. Kronk, how Gideon did we get here first? Doesn't Gideon the first lose his soul, too? Yes, Gideon the first soul dies fighting the resurrection beast, and Hero takes over the body for the whole confrontation with, exactly, uh, so... with the lectures and God. Yeah, so by the end of the book, it's it's Gideon's body, but only Pyrrha's soul is inside. Cause... Literally the only lic- full-on lictor left is Ianthe. Yes. Which is kind of fucking insane. I mean, she's gonna be fucking powerful in whatever future is to come. Well, uh, since maybe she'll get what she mostly wants. all she cares about. Her face well, on posters. I mean, there's Ianthe, and then there's Pal. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah what, what we didn't even mention the uh, weird ass Apple Pal is. We'll we'll just call we'll just call the comp the composite of uh, calamities and Camilla a sex cam. That that's easy yep. to remember. Sex cam, very good, very good. Um, Look, sex pal plus cam equals sex cam. Obviously, yeah, no, it's it's very very obvious. It's correct. Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing. We we basically don't even know what their thing is. We don't know if Camilla has inherited quote unquote any necromantic ability. Or if she basically is just really smart because Pal was? Uh, no, at, at the very end she has Palamity's eyes. Yes. She is the yeah, body. Yeah. I, I get that. But, but, but as far as we know, in all other lictors, the necromancer is the body that remains. And since we don't know how necromancy works, we don't know if that lictor can do necromancy or not. Right. Yeah, yeah, we're we're gonna have to wait until the next book to find out, and it's gonna be torture yeah. waiting. <laughs> I'm glad we're getting it soon. Yeah, Nona is gonna be a weird ass book based on everything we've heard about it. I have no idea what's going to be going on in that book. I genuinely don't know. No, All none right. of us do. All right, theory time. Then. Let's go into theory time. Yeah, <laughs> you guys okay. spit out. So... 
spit out your theories because you've had more time to co- compile them than I have. <laughs> I mean, the, the big one is, can Gideon come back and how can Gideon come back? And I think it's a very, very resounding yes. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, her body just, just for, straight up has not rotted in exactly. the weeks for since we know, she died. Yes, her body still exists. There is precedent for her surviving things that should have killed her because she didn't die when all the other children on the ninth were sacrificed. She got exposed to nerve gas that blinded two yeah. necromancers. And it's it's very, like, they very specifically and explicitly say, you should have died. There is no reason for you to still be alive. You just are. Right. So what we know is that she has an incredibly tough body, apparently. We know that her soul is still alive. And John just said, most likely separating you again would destroy you. But I mean, what does most likely mean in fiction, right? Mm-hmm. But I think that won't happen before, like, the middle of the final book or something. Right. I mean, you have, you have, to, you have to make sure these characters are a happy ending. Yeah, they... If any characters ever fucking earned it. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't what? even have to be, like, a super happy ending. Like, honestly, at this point, I can't even tell you if, if Gideon and Harrow are endgame, if that's, if that's in the cards, just because how fucked up everything is. Hmm. It'll be interesting just, to see how it plays out. But just having them in a position where that's an option would in be a good. Mm-hmm. And yeah. yeah. Like, basically, I can see if if they say, well, we, that's not really what this book is about, you know? Right. Um. So, yeah, I mean, but going into that, like, at some point, Harrow is going to notice how she was able to open the locked tomb. And given how much that, like, that transgression fuels her character, it's going to be very interesting to see how she relates to that, how she deals with that, even deals with the knowledge of, of, of that Gideon is essentially the closest thing to, to God she will ever have. Well, she's right. basically, she is, as we said, the in-universe equivalent to Jesus. Yeah, exactly, very much. And and yeah, it's just a very like that's going to be very interesting because I I cannot imagine her not learning that somehow. Right. <clears throat> it's going to be very fun. I'm really like my theories are mostly just who is Anastasia? And I want to know what's going on there. Anastasia, Anastasia is interesting because we hear from John, who is unreliable at best in terms of exposition, that um, um, something went wrong in the uh, Lecter Hood ritual for Anastasia and her cavalier. Uh, and we're not entirely sure what it is because John could have just been lying out his ass. He probably was, considering I mean, who we're talking to. As he says, what when Augustine asks uh, if that's the truth or what he tells himself the truth is, what's the difference? Right. That's literally how he responds. Yeah, I mean, for a man in his position. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm very sure that we're going to see some th- some fallout for the tomb having been opened like at, at some point that's going to come into play. Right. I mean, that's, I mean kind that... of, that's kind of what I think the plot of Electo is going to be. Probably. Yeah, probably. I mean, that, like... that does lead pretty directly into the question of who the fuck is Nona. Yeah, who yeah. is Nona? And why is she also awesome? No fucking clue. <laughs> because she has a six-legged dog and a burger shirt. Yes. Yep. My genuine belief is that there is some connection between her and the the former Ninth House Cav. The that former be... Ninth House Lictor. Yeah, that would not be surprising. Yeah, I mean, there's a few options. I th- I think at this point... I'm reasonably 
convinced that it is Harrow's body in some shape or form. I, I think it might but, be either Electo or Anastasia in Gideon's body. Gideon the, is too. Gideon's more ripped than that. Yeah, like the 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 artist has said, she has black hair and golden eyes. Which, who? Who? Uh, Nona. Nona. Yeah, Gideon's so black, ginger. Exactly. So black hair and golden eyes would point to Harrow's body with right someone piloting it. There's a lot gold, of. There's With the too golden many eyes, people. it's most... I'm not going to say most likely, but it's very likely that it is Gideon, but just in some mind or, wipe. Or Electo. Form, maybe? But hmm. it could also be Electo, exactly. And that's the interesting one, right? Because... It, it being Electo would be hilarious. I mean, that, that would make sense. In a roundabout way. Yeah. The only thing that wouldn't make sense is from from what we know, whoever is in control of the body has lost their memories. And that would make more sense for Gideon than for Electo, or, but also what the fuck do we know about Electo? Nothing. We, we know fuck it's, all. It's yeah. It's it could be Gideon it could be Harrow in Electo's body. Who the fuck what the fuck do we know? I don't think it's Electo's body. Like I'm Again, I'm I th I'm pretty sure it's Harrow's body. That, from what the author has, uh, the artist has said, and from what the plot has been doing, that does make sense to me. I'm not entirely sure how Harrow's body got there, but that's also because I don't really remember what Gideon last, did at the end. Last of the time we book. saw, last time we saw Gideon Harrowbod, she was tumbling yeah. through the river uh, after uh, it got after the Mithraim got plunged into yeah. it. So that is an option that maybe Pal pulled her out. Sex Pal. A sex, sex Cam pulled camp. her out? Yeah. Maybe Sex Cam pulled her out. And now she's trying to get one of the two, either Harrow or Gideon, to take control again. But there is someone third there, and that makes the whole thing more difficult. Possibly. Having having a three body shuffle. Very interesting and very fun. Yeah, I will admit like that. That is the closest thing I have to a to any at all substantiated theories for the next book. That it's someone else piloting Harrow's body, and even if it is Gideon, it's not really Gideon. It's some, which kind of sucks because that means no matter who it is, if it is indeed Harrow's body, no matter who it is, we're gonna lose that character at some point. Right. My, like, I want to believe in my heart of hearts that it's, like, someone who is, like, from the past, get, like, getting a second shot. And I mm -hmm. want to believe that. <laughs> you know? I just want to believe that. No, I get it. I get that. That's, uh... But, yeah, I, I wouldn't know who from the past it would be and why they would be in this point i mean at this point we don't really know how the river works fuck for all we know it's gideon the first <laughs> whose soul wasn't hilarious this kind of I mean, what was not, fun was uh seeing a q a of the uh, of uh, the author basically uh talking about the covers and uh rating who's having the best to worst times on yeah. the respective covers and uh yeah. Apparently, known as having the best time, and Harrow is I mean, having the worst course. time. Also, yeah. <laughs> Gideon's uh, like having a good time, but not as good as Nona. Yeah, yeah apparently, no, no, no. Lecto will be having a better time than Harrow as well, mm. but a worse well, time than Gideon. No, I'm not, I don't think it's that hard to have a better time than Harrow in that second book and on that cover by extension. Harrow yeah. was having a bad yes. time. <laughs> because there was not a single page in that book where Harrow was not having a terrible time. Except maybe in the coffee shop AU. Yeah, <laughs> coffee shop AU was fun. Also, when she got, she got she made some real nice soup. <laughs> um, Hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, but no, I think like it's not 
like that's what makes it interesting. It's very hard to speculate on this book because the author has pretty much said this is a very different beast. Like this is the weird one, which is yeah, which is saying a, something. A lot this was so, the second one. This was supposed to be part one of book three. Yeah, exactly. She just got yeah. so the author just got so enamored by Noda as a character that she thought that it would she be best to expand Act One into a, yeah. uh, no, its own book. Yeah, and that that's what makes it particularly hard to speculate on this one because this one is basically going to be a side story that connects to the rest by the end. Yeah, mm-hmm. is the feel I'm getting. No idea but what. Fine. Yeah. No, no, I, I'm not. I'm not against it at all. It just it makes it like it's it's easier for me to to theorize on what the actual ending, like the fourth book, will be because there we just know so little about about the next one because yeah we have no idea who and what is going on at all oh it's just hard to speculate too much about the series because like there's just so much that's a mystery i mean what i want to happen what probably won't but what i want to happen is by the end that Haru and gideon just go to a nice green planet build a nice cottage in the woods and just live there. I want for a lot of the characters I read about. And yeah, never really. Happen. No, it never happens. It's just... Uh, Look, it, let's, it let's... happens one time and then they died, all right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Which, which book are you talking about? Uh, the Divine Cities trilogy. <laughs> Look, Gideon deserves her cottage core outfit. Oh, I agree. A hundred percent. She she deserves to be a cottage core butch lesbian, just living in the countryside, living her best life. I promise you, there's fan art of that. Oh, there is oh, absolutely. Yeah. Fan I art can't of that. find it right now, but I promise you, there's fan art of that. Uh, yeah, no, that's no surprise. I'd be disappointed if it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. Any, uh, man, uh, there's just talk? there's just so much we couldn't even touch upon, like the yeah, the Cavaliers I mean, of the original Lictors. We didn't even talk about yeah. any of them besides Pura briefly. I mean, as I said, we we should probably do another one once the fourth book is out, and just also we should probably do another one when the third book is out. Just talk yeah, about the third shit, book like, yes, and going. all the other stuff we missed. Yeah. But yeah, uh, if you guys are uh, cool with it, I think this is probably a good point to end this because holy yeah, shit. Yeah, I mean, we could yeah. probably like do this for two more hours, but I think... Probably, but it would mostly be us rambling at that, by the end yeah, of it. I think so too. I, I think we are far beyond any form of structured discussion at this point. Yeah. We're just like geeking out about how good these books are. Yeah. In case you haven't figured out, we recommend these books highly. Yeah. This is kind of like the Bloom Into You episode we did some time ago. It's just, it's really good. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, both are series about uh, lesbians, just very different tonally and (laughs) setting-wise. Very different lesbians. (laughs) One is is happy, the other is Bloom Into You. No, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's mean, even for me. Yeah, Bloom and Two is a lot cheerier than this series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Uh, that should do it for tonight. Uh, thank you all for watching. Um, tentative plan for Saturday is going to be a gaming stream featuring Mill, Fuzzy, and possibly me. Sunday, we are going to be following up on that massive fucking cliffhanger that ended our D&D session. <sighs> I might actually not be around for that. I'll talk. I'll message Kaido. Okay, please let us know. Because um, if not, we will be waiting another week for that cliffhanger resolution. <laughs> oh, boy. And um, Tuesday, uh, Mill has something, probably, with maybe Fuzzy. I don't know. Uh, Anyways, thank you all for watching, and we will see you next time.
Later. See ya. Goodbye.